welcome to Note Doctors. My name is Paul. My name is Jen. My name is Ben. And we are your hosts. We are all university music theory instructors who are passionate about music theory and music theory instruction. In this podcast, we will be talking about all things theory with some of the best music theory teachers in the country. If you want to know more about music theory and the most effective and innovative ways to teach it, this is the podcast for you. So today we're going to be talking with Dr. Jennifer Beavers. And so, um, Ben, tell us a little bit about her. Yes, Jenny Beavers is a music theorist who specializes in early 20th century music analysis and music theory pedagogy. Her primary research centers on the music of Ravel, in which she brings established modes of formal and harmonic analysis together with timbre analysis, orchestration theory, neurology, and disability studies. Um, Her secondary research is in music theory pedagogy, which combines her passion for teaching and research. One of her greatest joys at UTSA centers around activities with students and the UTSA Music Theory Club. She was awarded the Faculty Mentor Award for undergraduate research in 2019. Students are super fired up about the opportunity to express their ideas, um, to stretch intellectually. Even now when we we think our students are very overloaded and overwhelmed, my theory club has never been more vibrant. They want to stretch academically and intellectually and and really engage with material deeply. Um, And they also would like some homework passes too, I'm sure. But you know, just to like have their ideas be considered. So today our special guest is Jenny Beavers, and we are so pleased to have you here um, with us virtually through Zoom. And before we kind of get talking about our topic of the day, which is uh, music theory clubs and mentoring uh, undergraduate students, I want to talk just a little bit with you about kind of your background, how you ended up being a theorist, you know, how did the sun and moon and stars align perfectly so that you were you know, a theory professor, or maybe they didn't align and you're just kind of (laughs) guessing at the constellations as you go. (laughs) That's a great question. I don't really know how, how did I get here? I really don't know. I always, this is the weird part, is that I always just saw myself teaching college. I wanted to be like that professor, but I didn't know like how to get there or like what I wanted to do. But I pretty was I was pretty sure that I was going to be a flutist. I wanted to, you know, take my primary instrument. I wanted to be like my teacher, you know, playing in a symphony and then also teaching at a college. It seemed like a great gig. Uh, and then I kind of started doing some math. I was like, so she's in symphony rehearsals all day and like weekends, holidays. And then she's teaching these people all day over and over again. And then the weekends are out. It's like, oh, this maybe not be for me. <laughs> Uh, but I pursued it really hard and rigorous and I think it was a huge part of why I became a theorist but uh I was not the the typical theory success story I was not a great undergraduate student I wasn't really good at theory I was like b level maybe c level I was too worried about being cool and hanging out with the cool kids between classes and (laughs) I loved theory And I had some pretty okay teachers growing up, but I didn't sink my teeth in until I really started to think about graduate school. I was like, oh, I don't want to do flute. What else would I like to do? How about pick the hardest class you ever had, right? How about how about that music theory thing you were just average at? That sounds solid. There's usually not an audition, though, for that one, right? You're just like, I would like to be a major in theory. Okay, we'll take you, right? Yeah, right. (laughs) And now you are influencing young undergraduate students, right? You <laughs> full circle here. And so um, wh- one of the things we want to talk about is your work with um, undergraduates and how oftentimes in conferences we'll see you with like a gaggle of your students, <laughs> like following you around. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of unusual. You don't see that as often. And I think that's so cool that you're bringing them in. So talk to us a little bit about um, you know, the UTSA Music Theory Club. How did that get started? Um, tell us about that. Oh my gosh, that is just one of my brightest spots and my happiest 
joys of teaching at UTSA. And a gaggle is a great word for it because that's kind of how it started. I started teaching at UTSA and I was still finishing up my doctorate. So I was kind of commuting and adjuncting and I had just had a baby and the classes were early. I would leave at like four in the morning and get to class and just probably look crazy. And my students just, I don't know, saw the crazy in me and were like, that I like her. She's like us. <laughs> and they just, I had this wonderful cohort of um, students that we became really close. Uh, the hallway conversations just turned into like, everyone was in my office. And I was like, there's just, there's like some magic synergy here. And uh, they, they were just so lit up. And when I talked to them, I got lit up. And as a young faculty member, you're always trying to look for like, research areas and publish, publish, publish and teach, teach, teach. And I was like, let's put them together. Let's take all of these awesome people and let's create some undergraduate projects for y'all. And then in return, it'll kind of feed me and give me like a, a new thing to do. And it became this just wonderful thing that years and years later, we're on our fourth iteration of uh, a music theory club and each one of them is a gaggle of completely different people with completely different interests and it's always exciting to talk to these people because i never come up with any of the ideas it's almost all them so i just get to sit back and enjoy some conversation with some lit up people so yeah, it happened by complete accident and it happened before we even knew about public music theory. In fact, our first club called themselves PDMT, Public Displays of Music Theory. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> you know, That's great. I love that. Little, a little insight into like yeah. the undergraduate mindsets. Like totally. theory is just this like private thing inside the classroom. <laughs> They're like, what if we take it outside? Right, right. I was like, yes, let's do it. Yeah. Well, one thing that caught my caught my ear when you were talking is that the hallway conversations and like just talking to teachers during the during the pandemic here. One of the number one things that everyone misses is the hallway conversations. And I mean, yeah. that is that sparks so much of what we do, like conversations with colleagues, like on research, conversations with your students that like lead you to different places. That's happened so many times with me where I walk in with a lesson and then based on the student questions to that, it completely changes the lesson in a good way. Yes. Yeah. And we're all kind of missing those hallway conversations oh, right yes. now, but hopefully the podcast can help in some way with that. But, you know, it's not the same. It's not the same. Yeah. Yeah, so much of what we do is collaborative. And I know that I'm not alone when I talk about how frustrating it is to teach in this flat screen medium where it's really hard to just pivot on the spot because you can't feel the temperature of the room or, yeah, those <laughs> in the classroom conversations, like as you're walking in, someone's saying something, you're like, oh my gosh, you just totally <laughs> changed my lecture right yeah. now. Yeah. I know. I do Or they that stop too. talking. There's that too. That happens to me sometimes. I walk in and they stop talking and I'm like, okay, what didn't you understand in the homework? <laughs> Let's just go for it. So yeah, for sure. So, so what kind of activities do you do in the music theory club and what sort of students are in that group? We do all kinds of different things. Uh, let's see. One of the unifying things that the students always want to do is they just want to get together and be in the same space as other people that heart theory. They just want to talk. And, you know, we we joke that we're just nerding out on stuff. But it, I mean, I just can't think of a better way to explain it. You just take something and go with it. And it becomes this like interactive roundtable. Um, so they like to just talk about what's going on in their mind. Like I just saw this movie and the sound, uh, the score for it. Let's talk about that. Or have you ever thought about, and then they come up with some crazy off the wall topic that you have never thought about. And you're like, I, I don't even know how to start that. So sure. Let's, let's talk about it for an hour. Like for instance, one of the first meetings, um, we had, I remember the students were like really into slam poetry and they, I guess they had maybe mm. some of them had just gone and seen some live slam poetry and they were super curious about the rhythm aspects and how that might be similar to or different than rap and how would we annotate that as theorists, like what, what sort of rhythm component and I was like, wow, not my wheelhouse, but let's do it. Uh, so there was, there's always things like that. But it seems like the group, no matter what I do, always divides into kind of two. There's those that want to, you know, 
geek out on the researchy side of things. And then there's those that are really interested in that sort of um, outreach or pedagogy type of, hmm. they want to do tutoring or they want to, you know, go to a high school and work with students in that capacity, provide lessons and support. Uh, you know, we have a proficiency exam. It's kind of like one of those gateway tests that they have to take before they go to upper coursework. And they're like, let's put together study sessions and make games and and things like that. So we always have two things that are going. Uh, the teaching kind of service or altruistic side of things. And then we have the researchy sort of uh, exploratory type of things. And we've had some pretty um, interesting research projects. I'm happy to talk about some of those, uh, but yeah. yeah. Well, one of, the, one of the early ones that we did was actually just a, um, a classroom crazy project that I did in uh, one of those weird conversations with a student walking in. Yep. Uh, and we were working on Sonata Form, and I just remember one of the students is like, Dr. Beavers, I just, I hate these scores. They're so small. Like, how are you supposed to like, you know, you go from small forms that fit nicely on one sheet and then you're like Sonata Form and you're just turning pages. You're like, is, is yeah. that the same as the first A? I, I yeah. don't know. Was what like measure are we ago? on? It's, oh, it's the second staff <laughs> down, the third page, halfway through. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah, it looks exactly the same if I remember. So I was like, oh man, I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna go crazy with this. And so, and I know that I think Ben and Jen, you guys have seen this project, but like yep. the butcher paper project. We took this <laughs> Beethoven sonata, blew it up like 800% and just wallpapered the room so that we could annotate it and turn it into like a, a VH1 pop-up butcher paper analysis of The <laughs> Tempest. Or, and I changed it every year. So it was always some, you know, kind of very narrative based story. And anyway, it became our theory club project because uh, those that were really into theory started to read up on Kaplan or Hepakoski Darcy, or some were really interested in exploring gesture. So we had some Hatton involved or some, you know, narrative stories. And it became this like living art piece. And so we took it on tour and went to a couple of conferences with it, presented at undergraduate symposiums, even uh, flirted with the idea of turning it into a um, collaboration with the engineering department where they had this like visual lab to make it electronic. So that was well, like one. That. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that was one kind of like pedagogy oriented uh, project that we did. Uh, our last one that we took on tour was uh, one of my favorites. Another, this one was entirely student conceived. And uh, they wanted to do sort of a survey of what are students listening to? You know, you, you're on campus, hmm. people always have their earbuds in. Are they just doing that because they don't want to talk to people or are they actually listening to something or, you know? And so they kind of started spitballing it a little bit and they're like, I bet all the stuff they're listening to is just pretty boring stuff. Like it's pretty, you know, the bias that they don't listen to complex music. It's just what music majors listen to. <laughs> so I kind of, we started challenging that. We're like, well, what if we did a survey? Like, what mm. are you listening to right now? So we, we uh, filed for an IRB and we got permission to survey live people around the campus. And so anyone who was wearing earbuds, we had these signs, it's like, what are you listening to? Music Theory Club wants to know. And it turned out these these students wanted to tell you everything about what they were listening to. They That's weren't so annoyed. <laughs> they were like, oh yeah. And have you heard this song? They'd like take their earbud out and try to let us listen to it. <laughs> So we got a list and then we decided, okay, now we're going to analyze this enormous list of, you know, 250 songs and see how complex it was. So we had to develop a rubric and then coming up with how are we going to analyze it was really, that was like a theory lesson in and of itself. And yeah. then the analysis part, oh my gosh, <laughs> that was so insane. It was all RL based and we had all these parameters and how do you rate it and yeah, so it just became this giant project with data everywhere, uh, hours and hours of work, and we got to take it to Santa Barbara and present it, and uh, that was just a goal. That was a game changer for all of us, and um, took away best in show at our undergraduate research symposium, and uh, yeah, just lots of interesting things came out of that. Well, I'm sure. Um 
the administration likes that too because you're, they're always looking for um, opportunities for students to do scholarship and sometimes music has a hard time with that especially mm -hmm. undergraduate students um, and so this theory club is that opportunity for these students to do kind of real research and being able to present it alongside you know kind of serious disciplines like the sciences and those things like we can we can go toe to toe with those as well yeah i mean you bring up an excellent point because um i'm actually writing a chapter on music theory clubs right now and you know we do what we do we get that little literature survey of what what do people say about these clubs and they basically always group music clubs into the cultural you know cultural enrichment not the same as these hard science STEM things. And you look at what are the STEM people doing? Well, they're problem solving, right? And they're identifying and applying uh, skill sets and they're developing those skill sets and then they're working in a team and then they're analyzing. And I'm like, that's exactly what a music theory club is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, There's totally. And there are so many levels of mentorship involved with that on both sides. Like it doesn't mean you just design this project and then hit a button and say go and then they come back with all these results and they're submitting it to a conference. Like all those levels of mentorship are so hugely important in so many ways to kind of guide your students through all those different steps. It's, it's just huge. Yeah, it's the extra and the extracurricular, right? Like it's just a whole <laughs> bunch of interacting and yeah, you're always reachable by phone and email when those <laughs> projects are coming to a head. <laughs> yep. I'm curious, did the students kind of change their idea about the simplicity of the music that their friends were listening to while walking around after analyzing all that music and really digging into it? Did it change that viewpoint or did it reinforce yeah. it? Yeah, actually, uh, parts of it were reinforced. It does turn out that quite large swaths of music uh, that we listen to, at least as everyday listening, kind of walking around campus, is pretty simplistic, um, or pretty repetitive. But the thing that we did realize is one, boy, are we judgmental as a group of you know theorists. We really thought we knew what we were doing. Two, the skills that we needed to access almost immediately when we were doing this type of analysis were sort of related to what we do in the classroom, right? There's mm -hmm. a lot of oral listening. You had to have some vocabulary involved. But really, we were just like, why aren't we doing more of these things, right? These timbre analyses. Like, mm -hmm. how do we talk about rhythm aside from, you know, when the beat changes or, you know, like all of these things that we experience when we are everyday listening uh, provided this really interesting two part pathway between like, oh, yeah, we do this in our classroom. But almost everything that we found complex was the stuff we don't actually develop hmm. in the curriculum. You know, we didn't talk about harmony. We didn't talk about melody, really. You know, it became more about the lyrics or instrumental virtuosity or texture changes or uh, engineering feats that were happening, you know, things like that. I think yeah, that's profound thing. because we are <laughs> right. all training. I mean, I, I don't know. We have this music business program. We're training these students to go out and work in that world. And we're training them with skills that are super valuable about harmony and melody and all of those things. But I think you're right that like the music they want to work with so much of what's interesting and complex about it is uh, other than that. And so how do we do that better? I think yeah. that's great. There's a huge shift from these like primary parameters. We're experiencing this every day right now of mm -hmm. our curriculum and our assessment of what is wrong with our curriculum. Yep. And to this like secondary area, which is already sort of derogatory, like, oh, it's less important. Uh, it's kind of th the thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Well, we just treat it as secondary. I don't know why, but we do. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's hard to talk about. I mean, it really yeah. is. Yes. Even in my primary there, I did it again. My primary area of research has really been going into orchestration and timbre and how composers use this and you know, I've been told flat out, like, you can't talk about timbre analytically. It's too descriptive. I'm like, well, then what are we doing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Also false. That's not true right, at all. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> false. Yeah. yeah, totally. No, I really enjoyed some of your timbre stuff. I really did. And uh, 
Students love to talk about timbre. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I think they're going to be the generation that's going to help us blow it up. Totally. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. So you have all sorts of students who seem just gung ho, ready to do theory, all those things. Um, how would you recommend, you know, any of us or the, our, our listeners going about, you know, trying to start something like that? Maybe we have students who are like, yeah, let's do it. Maybe we have students who are like, no, we don't want to do that at all. Um, <laughs> you know, we might have differing levels of interest. And maybe you have some stories, too, about maybe some students who were at first were like, what is this theory club about? Or maybe when they were freshmen, they're like, no way. But then maybe by the time they're seniors, they're like, I don't know, pre- do you have presidents or, you know, chairpersons of the Yeah, the, uh, the, the club? we do. We have a president and everything. But yeah, I mean... Uh, well, one thing that's pretty apparent when it's like, hi, I'm Jenny. I'm the extroverted theorist you met at that conference. (laughs) You know, like I am a little (laughs) bit like easy to approach. So I think that that is appealing to the students. They feel like they can, you know, ask me questions or if they were to do something outside the classroom, they'd like to foster that. So I think like the number one thing we do, all of us, is uh, make ourselves accessible, open right, to conversations and allowing the students to, you know, to, to feel part of that process, that the learning is really guided by their reactions to our material. Like, yeah, sure, we want to talk about these things. We've got to hit these benchmarks and objectives, but like it's the questions of the students that take it to the interesting places, right? So I think that um, just having those hallway conversations with students and also being really Uh, I don't know if aggressive is the right word, but like putting theory out there. It's not just this two-year curriculum that you guys all take as music majors, right? There's an entire field about it. In fact, you know, I didn't get my PhD in how to teach phrases or, oh, worse, (laughs) oral skills. Like, well, why is that on our shoulders? But we do all of these other really cool things you guys haven't heard about. Would you like to hear about it? And the answer is almost always, yeah. I I had no idea. It's kind of like career shop day. So making uh, a a point to share interesting things that you hear about, um, especially some of the new stuff, you know, like when you go to a conference, what did you bring back? That sort of stuff. Um, And then talking about opportunities. Students are super fired up about the opportunity to express their ideas, um, to stretch intellectually. Even now, when we Mm. we think our students are very overloaded and overwhelmed, my theory club has never been more vibrant. They want to stretch Mm. academically and intellectually and and really engage with material deeply. Um, And they also would like some homework passes too, I'm sure. But, you know, just to like have their ideas be considered. And the idea of going to a conference with like-minded people is really exciting to them, right? Travel, meeting scholars, meeting students, thinking about graduate school. So many of them, like me, you know, start undergrad, like I'm just going to probably be a band director or flute player. And they're like, oh, I could go on to grad school and like get these upper level degrees and then teach at the college level. That seems even cooler. So just being accessible, presenting all of these opportunities for them. And I actively am advocating for funding to get these students, you know, out the door into a conference, um, looking at scholarships, grad schools. Uh, As soon as I meet a faculty member that has a graduate program, they're super excited about my music theory people because they're like, ooh, you have any interesting upcoming graduate students for us to consider? And I'm like, well, yes, I do. Here's my catalog. <laughs> Who are you looking for? <laughs> like a matchmaker. Yeah. That's right. I'm a, That's I'm awesome. a theory matchmaker. <laughs> that explains my last year. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. That's really cool. Yeah. I mean, I've had several students end up going into uh, graduate programs in theory or uh, adjacent musicology um, from their interactions in the conferences. You know, it it is a match. You like, oh, so you study this thing that I'm interested in and you're at this university. So what do I need to do to get there? And then that's where that connection sort of happens. That's really great. So do you have a theory major at UTSA or like what kind of students are in this club? What are their majors? What do they do? 
We do not have a concentration in music mm-hmm. theory at all. Um, we have a lot of music ed and performance and uh, music marketing. Uh, that's the other kind of big one. We do have graduate programs like in, in piano pedagogy and, and performance, but nothing in theory. So this really does feel like, especially for faculty who are heavily involved in research, uh, it's like a way to create your little theory major without mm-hmm. the extra courses to teach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Yeah, that's great. I, cause I don't, we don't have a theory major at TW either. So like having these opportunities, like, you know, having a club or having even my little group of tutors is special, yes. um, to kind of help to nurture them. And did I hear correctly? They get a homework pass if they're in the club. What, 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 I, that seemed <laughs> no. like a little carrot that you were dangling out for students. Maybe. <laughs> I was just joking that, you know, like they do want to stretch their minds intellectually, but they probably would love a break from classroom stuff. Oh. You know, you don't, you don't really see that in the classroom they're not like mm, please tell me more about these <laughs> elided cadences <laughs> they might not be like ready to grasp that but you know like you take them and you want to talk mm-hmm. about the things they're interested in that's what they yeah. want to stretch for you mm-hmm. know yeah no there's no real perks or uh, passes per se mm-hmm. that would be brilliant though I was going to tag on one thing to that too that when you come, when you talk about graduate schools and the way your theory club, I guess, pursues these different interests, it's almost more like a grad school model because you have to come in with your kind of interests and your kind of passions, and then your your mentors kind of help you kind of pursue like what it is, and maybe you get redirected a, a couple times, and that certainly was the case for me. Um, yeah, but like right? that kind of model and that kind of like uh, mentorship is just is great. That's that's what's going to help them so much. When I they go agree. On. It is like a little bitty uh, graduate school model. In fact, you know, those two branches, you know, you've got those that are really interested in pedagogy and those that are really interested in research. Yep. Those are what you end up doing in graduate school. You have your TA ship. Right. And then you've got your like area of interest. And we do it as faculty, too. But it's really interesting to the students to think about going into grad school. Like, what what do I need aside from a paper? Maybe some exposure, some literature, you know, hands-on uh, involvement in a, a complex project that can go into a thesis sort of, you know, area. And they also want to, like, go into graduate school having, you know, co-taught with you, help them develop a lesson plan, have them come in and teach your oral skills class. Each one of them, of course, has their own specific track and interest. So last year, I had uh, uh, several students. They were all interested in different things. And at, for a while there, I was just just swinging at stuff. I was like, all right, we got, <laughs> we got video game interests over here. We got vocal music and film scores. And, you know, I was like, oh, and this, this is like some postmodern stuff and just grabbing and trying to make a plan for each of them and it was so awesome and each of them came and taught one of my classes so at least i got a I got a homework pass <laughs> i can have to teach <laughs> pay it forward that's right so i mean it, it did work out but it, it is a great way to help them sort of see what what would it be like if you were to go to graduate school like did you right. love reading this article or right. you know what did it tell mm-hmm. you about it and some of them were like yeah i understood more of it than i thought i would you know, so it, it's it's an interesting thing for them to get their toes wet before they <laughs> commit, you know. <laughs> That's really good. So can you tell us a little bit about, about UTSA just in general? What kind of place is it? How many students are there? What's the music program like? Well, we are awesome. I <laughs> love I love UTSA. We are uh, a fairly large school here in Central Texas. There's about 35,000 students. We're a Hispanic serving institution, so um, we have a large proportion. I think we're close to 60% uh, Hispanic. So um, we also have a really vibrant um, first gen program. I'm actually first gen myself. So am I. uh, Yay, and our names are Jen. (laughs) I know. I know. (laughs) So uh, I'm actually like a first gen uh, mentor, faculty mentor, and I have a lot of crossover with my familia. Uh, my music majors and they kind of follow me in my familia and in the music theory club 
but I'd say we're probably close to 50% first gen. So that's such a unique uh, learning Mm -hmm. environment and something that um, I feel extremely passionate about, especially having been one of those like unclear undergraduate students myself, sometimes not understanding deadlines or knowing what to do when lost or confused, who to turn and what questions to ask. And I feel like it's a great way to give back and see some real success, especially when they go into grad school and I'm like, you are welcome. I just saved you so many years of what I had to go through of like not knowing how to look for scholarships or, you know, yeah, things like that. So uh, our, our music majors are incredible. Uh, they're mostly interested in performance and education. Um, and a lot of them do go into uh, that those types of fields. So um, and a few of them going on to graduate programs. But they are very diverse in their interests. And um, for instance, just the other day, um, I don't know if you guys are uh, saw those great emails by the project on the studying um, the composers of color. They had a, an analysis mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. It was an all day mm-hmm. come and hang out in a Zoom room with us. Here's this list of uh, compositions and um, just help us contribute to this database. And so I yep. just kind of pitched it to my students like I don't know how many of you think this would be fun but would you want to spend like an hour and a half (laughs) analyzing uh, this music and they did because they were super committed to this idea of yeah we need diverse music I mean look at us and then you know like look at the faculty you know there's Mm -hmm. a big difference so like what do we need to do let's you know so I feel like they're fired up and they they just love the idea of making like bold radical changes and i'm on board yeah i was in a meeting in the morning that was like i think my third or fourth time going and it's been so great every single time i've been on there analyzing not only just seeing theorists but like using the time to really reshape how we think about our curriculum and you know the examples but even going beyond the examples i think you know the the really the basis of the curriculum just some of the discussions have been fantastic so well, and you know, shout like, out to uh, everyone who's coordinating that. Oh my gosh, the coordinators are phenomenal. That That is just such a great project. Uh, even just fundamentally down to the core of like, we chose a piece some, somewhat at random, mm. uh, a Florence Price piece, which I was just really excited to look at. And I thought for sure, no problem. We're gonna find her on YouTube. We'll listen to it and it'll make <laughs> this analysis easier. Zero, zilch. Not a, couldn't even buy yeah. it somewhere. Just did not exist. Yeah. So Pretty telling. it was, yeah. So the students and I were just like a collective <gasps> quiet moment. Like, well, this is why we have such a problem bringing in repertoire. If it's not even available, what do we do? Yep. Right. Totally. Are you teaching online these days or are you face to face or a mix? I'm a little bit of everything. I am mostly, I've been mostly virtual. Um, and that has been, <laughs> oh my gosh, exhausting to say the least. I loved flipping my class before all of this happened. So I thought I was like, oh, I'm so ready for virtual learning. There's a difference between making a 10 minute mm-hmm. video that was fun and supplementary to your class to like, mm-hmm. now that's all you do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yes. Good I luck making a 50 minute video and keeping anyone awake. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that has been literally just my passion project. And I decided uh, to go face to face for a small community of my students, especially I'm teaching a freshman oral skills class. It's a huge class, 27. I think that's huge for oral skills. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, they're freshmen and they're stuck in this like terrible class online. And they are like, can we please meet face to face? So I, I am going to campus now and it's not easier because you have to do both now. You're right. face to face, yep. and mm-hmm. I want a GoPro to, or like a uh, <laughs> yes, like a drone that just sort yes. of follows me around. Yes. And mm-hmm. oh my gosh, because you're like just... me, you walk a lot around the room, right? When you <laughs> teach, yeah, yeah. And I see my I video too. of myself, and I'm like, oh my, why? How many steps did <laughs> why I? Why can't I sit still? Yeah, I have. Yeah. I do that too. <laughs> 
Yeah. The, well, the, and it's didn't... hard, you know, teaching oral skills and you can't sing. So like you're going over harmonic progression and you can't be like, okay, everybody sing the bass line. You know, say the solfege is not the same. They're like, do, fi, so, la, you know, it's uh-huh. pretty awful. Yeah. Is it la? Is it lay? Is it la? I'm right. so confused. Or just hearing your own voice, right? Yeah. Just, yes. Now suddenly it's just you singing. And yeah. That's, yeah, all that's the time. Not, yeah. That's not good for anybody. No. Yeah, I've had to yeah. make a lot of caveats that I am not a singer. Like, and, <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think that... that that helps students though, because they know that, mm. you know, that that's not your main thing, but you can at least sing in tune and know yep. your solfege and sing in rhythm. And you can do that too, trombonist, right? <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> well, it's really not for the faint at heart. I mean, Mm-mm. it's True. not really building any of our uh, confidence levels. You see yourself in a camera all day now. Like I've <laughs> yes. never seen so much of me. Yeah, yeah. I've never mm-hmm. heard so much. I know. Why Fixing do my I... hair, my fingers, because <laughs> my fingers are on the document cam all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or editing out all the weird things you say at the beginning of sentences, like, okay, so, okay, so, so queso. Like, mm-hmm. anybody in the mood for chips and queso? <laughs> <laughs> Me, always. Why do I, yeah. Definitely. Why do I start every sentence with so? <laughs> you, live in San, you live in San Antonio. Just queso is every, everywhere, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It flows freely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in my teaching videos. <laughs> <laughs> just and after a while the editing just gets sloppier and sloppier like, i don't care like, just, whatever whatever we just gonna a, fly uh, fire drill this week oh. and i think i was recording and i know there were at least two or three oral skills classes that were going on during the fire drill so we had our oh. meeting today and we were recapping how did the fire drill affect you <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're face to face no, it was online, but I was recording. Oh. I was about 10, 12 minutes into a video, and then I had to go back, like you're saying, and just kind of paste together, and it just sounds awkward now because it's just <laughs> abrupt stopping of when the fire alarm started going off, you know? Yeah. You're all flustered, and you look different. Yeah. You're out of breath. And nothing <laughs> Like, nothing why is the score up? flashing all of a sudden? <laughs> And you're like, don't you hear that? Don't you hear that T going up to go there? <laughs> As if it's like a bitonal alarm going off in the background. Well, I know that I've had students with fire alarms going off. One kid, yeah. uh, you know, they're all muted. Mm-hmm. <sighs> That's the worst. They can't even speak. And yeah. uh, he's like trying to raise his hand and signal me like, there's a fire alarm going off. And I asked him to unmute himself. And of course, it's just... <laughs> I was just blaring, and I said to him, like, how long has that been going on? He's like, oh, for like five minutes. I was like, get out of there. Leave the building. Thanks for your commitment to this amazing lecture. It's but just like... oral skills one. <laughs> so how are you at matching pitch again? No, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's too good. It is. It's just too it's much. 2020. Oh so, my gosh! Yes. <laughs> and and what is your uh, what what's your music theory club working on this semester? You mentioned how they're vibrant and and still really active. So what are they doing uh, this semester? Yeah. What are we going to do? We've had a few meetings. We've got a few things all planned out. Like I, I recently gave a um, a keynote ooh, at um, MTMS up at Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. So I had this awesome um, video that I put together. More videos. Um, so we had a little watch party and uh, they really liked it. And we had this great conversation afterwards. So they asked uh, if we could do more of those types of things. So I found um, like a former member of the Music Theory Club, uh, another graduate student. So I'm bringing in areas of their interest. Uh, like there's a one on a movie uh, sound score and one on video games. So we're going to have a couple watch parties discuss and have them actually mentor the students about like, mm-hmm. how do you how do you even know what a research project is and how do you get involved in it? Uh, another huge part of our club this year is going to be uh, we want to reach out into underserved communities uh, and teach some theory lessons. So we were looking at some uh, high schools that aren't quite UTSA adjacent because they get all of the people, you know, they get all the mm-hmm. students that kind of go there. So we're reaching out further, especially since it's just on Zoom and uh, seeing what kind of support they need. You know, can we offer a video with like young high college faces that teaches a, a lesson? Or can we like do a theory pen pal sort of like ask me your questions and we'll give you some answers. 
uh, that sort of thing. So, uh, and the idea, of course, to diversify that pipeline. Mm -hmm. Like how many students are we losing? We see it all the time from high school into college. Mm -hmm. So if we can like give them some skills, not just those AP folks, you know, but the other theory classes going on, other band directors, you know, needing to talk about scales or, you know, how do we, how do we bring theory into the ensemble? You know, getting those kids involved uh, earlier is better, right? Mm -hmm. Those brains just, are super elastic. Mm -hmm. Totally. I just got an email today from a band director who had me as an instructor for theory and talking about resources and what should I be talking about, you know, and it was great. It was great that he came back and, and touched base, you know, and get that yeah. exposure and kind of expand our scope and our broaden our horizon in that way. That's yeah, like great. we get to put on our cape, right? It's like, this is one thing I'm really, really good at. I can give you resources. <laughs> yeah. No one ever needs a music theorist, but you sound like you need a music theorist and I am I'm here to help. <laughs> Come on, everybody needs a music theorist. <laughs> Rarely ever. <laughs> Well, but when those, it happens, it's amazing. <laughs> and those students are, are that you reach in high school are potential UTSA students, right? Yeah, and totally. so, of course, you probably have auditions for theory and things, and you're like, oh my goodness, they're not ready for theory one or all skills one. And, you know, hopefully those students who would have those experiences with your um, club members are prepared better. And then wherever they go to school, whether it's your school or another place, they can really go right into theory one and excel from Absolutely. the get-go. Absolutely. You know, like one huge obstacle that some students have, uh, especially if they're not at those like top music schools, and even there, they, they still have the same problems we have at all the other types of schools, mm -hmm. right? Is that kids come into college with the unknowingness that they have to sing. They're not an, mm -hmm. a singer, but they gotta sing. So that's a huge one. But what's even worse is that there's a small population of those students that can't match pitch. There's a lot of them are male. Maybe they mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sang a lot when they were young because we did that. You know, we mm -hmm. sang when we were young and then we stop when our voices change. They get to mm -hmm. college and now they've really fallen behind. So if we could get them singing more in their high school experience and the bands, mm -hmm. orchestras, the mariachis, the jazz, like just sing, 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 sing. Mm -hmm. That would just up how well they're going to perform when they come and audition at our schools. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, we do need to hear your voice. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was one of the responses that I wrote back to my student, Brandon, was like, it doesn't mean you have to use solfege all the time. It doesn't mean you have to do these elaborate slate things. Like, just sing back something on a neutral syllable is great. Right. That's oral skills, really, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a great starting point. And when you don't have it, oh, my gosh. It's just a huge uphill climb and yeah and the stats are pretty bad they're not gonna six they can't keep up they're gonna drop out or they're gonna fail confidence plummets it's just mm -hmm. bad news so yeah. even just that sort of simple interaction can make a huge difference on how well they do yeah. mm -hmm. absolutely for sure well, are we ready for some rapid fire questions? Yeah, we, we are unfortunately coming to the end of our time already, uh, but we're ready. All right, we're all in Texas, so we're ready to pew pew. There's a few <laughs> rapid fire questions here. All right. Okay, so um, do you want to go first? I always go first. I, go ahead, I don't Paul. have to go first. All right, well, I guess I'll go first. All right, this is this is a new question that I came up with just oh, the other night. So you always come up with these at like press. four in the morning. Uh, because now I might have listeners like you've listened to past episodes and you I don't want to say the same thing every time so wait let me get my uh, Google fingers ready no, I'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> so again this is this is just Alexa. off the cuff right <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right so my question is what early 21st century composer or musician living today will be in theory textbooks in 100 years from now so think about 2100 or whatever that is um what composer what you know musician it could be a popular artist you know who's who's going to be in our theory book in 100 years from now mm, that's such a good question but the i'm going to go with the, the first name that popped into my head because he's like everywhere and there's no one that hasn't been touched by this guy john williams is going to be in our theory textbooks because like He's just mm -hmm. doing everything that's already been done more modern. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
yeah, kind of true. That's a good point. Better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and people connect deeply to his music. Like so yeah. many students come and they want to write that kind of music. That's a really mm-hmm. common thing, I think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so, there's just yeah. so many great film score composers that are doing it. And this is the audience that really is just sinking our teeth into. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, They're I'm just sure. in articles right now, but they'll be textbooks, I'm sure. Yeah, that's yes. great. That's a great answer. All right. So if you had to choose, would you take Haydn's 106 symphonies <laughs> or Schubert's 630-ish songs? If you had to pick oh, between those gosh. two. Oh, gosh. Like finger gun to my head right now? Oh, my gosh. I'm going to go with piano pieces just because like that's a lot of them, but I'm going to say that one because I'm done working on these giant symphonies right now. Okay. <laughs> done. It goes back I'm to like... the sonata analysis <laughs> issues with all the pages. <laughs> I'm too much into like orchestrations and uh, theories of that stuff, but I just don't want to go backwards. I want it to like go forwards. So I don't want to go backwards anymore. No more backwards. <laughs> All right, I'm, okay, doing, ben, a, I'm doing. Yeah, I'm doing a new one today too that I haven't asked before. Dope based it. minor. Oh, <laughs> See, I, 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 I knew you were going to be ready. I That's like all... that one. I yeah, love that's a good one. one. You, got a bonus. You, know it's, you know it's controversial. You just like the controversy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. You like to form a division between your people. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, too good. All right, my question for today's rapid fire was going to be, what is your best advice to beginning theory students? What is your number one piece of advice to beginning theory students? Mm -hmm. I say fail fast. I I see so many students that just uh, feel like they have to be like awesome at it or they they just barely hang on, not asking any questions until they finally reach that breaking point and then they can no longer keep up. I say as soon as you realize you have a weakness, just like go ahead and tank on it and figure out why it is you're tanking because clearly you're not understanding one part of it. Mm -hmm. Like figure out what that one part is because I bet you once you develop that foundation, they're so embarrassed to ask those early questions. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know my key signatures and I don't know what you mean when you say sing tonic. Well, if you don't know that, you're not going to know anything else. So like fail fast. (laughs) Do it in the first week. Don't do it at midterms. It's too late for me to help you recover your grade, yeah. right? And and you're mm-hmm. already frustrated and confused. So just get it out of your system. We are all failing at some point. Do it now. Yeah, <laughs> totally. That's I think totally. sometimes they think it means something really big. Like if I yeah. have a question or if I don't understand, it means I can't do this or I, I'm not a good musician or I don't have what I need yeah. or whatever. And all it means just... is you don't know. Yeah. So just ask the question. I tell them that all the time. Yeah. My students that all the time. All it means is you don't know. Yeah. So or just I said ask it me. wrong. I said it yeah. in a way that just didn't make it's it's me, right. not you, right? Like I can I can tell it to you another way. How about this right. way? Oh, you maybe liked it that way? Okay, cool. Yeah, maybe it hasn't sunk in yet. It doesn't mean anything bigger than that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's totally true. Yeah, Paul's seminar this summer. Failure is not failure. That was Michael That's Hamilton true. quoted me on that. Yeah, they tweeted that out. I truly believe that. <laughs> failure is not failure. You have to embrace failure um, in order yeah. to improve yourself. That's so, so 100%. crucial. 100%. And music's the perfect platform to do this. We fail yeah. so many times, all the mm-hmm. time on our instruments. The really good peop- good musicians make a lot of mistakes. Yep. yep. And they just know how to move past them, right? It's mm-hmm. the beginners that you make that mistake and then they stop. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I don't even know how to recover from my mistake. I'm so bad and new at making mistakes, right? <laughs> but after you're really good at making mistakes, you just recover faster. So yep. there's a lot of beauty in that. Yeah. Just oh, keep yeah. going, right? True. Absolutely. Yeah. Just keep on going. Keep well, going. Well, unfortunately, we have to stop. Aw, <laughs> let's keep going. <laughs> but um, as we finish up, as we wrap up, could, uh, tell us a little bit about maybe um, a project that you're, you're working on or have in the works, and also kind of how uh, folks could contact you, find you on the internet if you want to be found, um, if they have questions and things they want to talk to you about. Well... Awesome. Let's see. Some of the things I'm working on right now is uh, some timbre studies. Really interested in uh, orchestration and the way composers use timbre. So I am 
really hungry for those conversations and other people that are working on it in different mediums. It's really informative. Um, I work mostly on Ravel, but I'm trying to branch out. And one of the areas I'm super interested in going into next is like 1920s American jazz, because there's mm-hmm. so many cool sounds. And all of the composers at that time are just pretty much lifting them and putting them in their music. So mm-hmm. love to see that. And it's like 100 years ago already. So yeah. we're right Crazy. there. So interesting. I've also got a lot of uh, interest in pedagogical stuff. Um, I'm interested in uh, well, before I leave the Ravel area, I also am interested in neurological processes, you know, like how do composers change as they age mm-hmm. and what sorts of mm-hmm. different ways um, do their art forms go? So that's another area. But I am interested in pitch batching and uh, how we teach that in the oral skills curriculum. How do we how do we mentor students? What are all the, the various problems that we experience from production to perception to memory to actually caring to do it, <laughs> which is a big one. <laughs> and music theory clubs yeah. is a huge passion of mine. Anyone who ever wants to, as we say, nerd out about uh, projects to do. I just met this amazing student at um, NC State named Anna Lee. I Googled music theory clubs, her name popped up and I had this great conversation. They don't even have a music major there and she started her own music theory club. So I would just love to have this Music theory clubs unite sort of thing. So if you have a music theory club, reach out to me. And where do you find me? You can't. I'm not (laughs) on any of the cool platforms. I'm not on the Facebook, (laughs) the Instagram, or the Twitter. But I am on email constantly. So you can email me at jennifer.beavers at utsa.edu. So that's our show. Thank you so much for listening to Note Doctors, the music theory and pedagogy podcast. We'll be back with more interviews with professors and teachers who will be dropping all sorts of theory knowledge for your education, edification, and enjoyment. So until then, bye-bye.